Welcome back. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I only get 15 minutes per video on Screencast-O-Matic, so I'm trying to keep these shorter anyway. So this will be a fairly short video just to kind of finish up here. Um, we were talking about D-Day um, and how sort of you know brutal it was, how deadly it was. Uh, it was a huge risk, uh, but it it proved to be very successful. The Americans, with the uh, bolstering the Allied forces, were able to overwhelm Germany on the Western Front. You also, at the same time, you had the Soviet Union um, pushing the Germans out of Russia. Um, Hitler sort of made the same mistake that Napoleon made, thinking he could invade Russia and ultimately failing at this because Russia is huge, first of all, and uh, it's cold, the win a cold winter. But uh, by 1945, 1944-1945, uh, the uh, Soviet Union had started pushing uh, Hitler's forces out of Russia. So uh, by uh, spring of 1945, both fronts had kind of compressed in on Berlin um, and ending, thus ending the war in Europe. Um, so you have it here quite successful. By December 1944, the front had reached Alsace. We talked about Alsace in World War One. Talk about World War One, And then the front reaching Berlin by spring of 1945, uh, thus uh, bringing a conclusion to World War Two in Europe anyway. So uh, Hitler, um, one of the best things he ever did is probably kill himself. I hate, you know, it sounds kind of brutal, but, uh, you know, he's a very dangerous guy, uh, very bad man. So he, he does commit suicide. There's sort of an interesting uh, aspect to this. Uh, Hitler was an avid uh, fan of Richard Wagner, who was a composer. And so it's been suggested by, by music historians and music critics that Hitler sort of envisioned the fall of the Third Reich the way that uh, Die Götterdämmerung ends. It's an opera by Wagner where the world basically erupts in flames. So if, if you can't save the world, you destroy it. So how sort of his death in the end of the Third Reich uh, may have sort of been inspired by Wagner. So again, there's another case of Hitler, the aesthete, the aesthetics of power, the aesthetics of, of, of dictatorship. Uh, he was an artist. He was an aesthetic individual. So again, it... Um, Listening to classical music and loving art doesn't necessarily make you a good person. This is, I think, a, a good lesson for, uh, to learn from World War II. Uh, it's sort of pitched as that in music education courses, that, or music appreciation courses, which I teach, that uh, all this stuff makes you a better person. That's a lot of crap. Uh, that's not true. Um, so, uh, the war in Japan extends a little longer. Um, and this is all we'll close with this. Uh, the U.S. drops the atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project comes to fruition with the development of the atomic bomb, dropping two of them, one on Hiroshima and then another one on Nagasaki. Uh, Hiroshima's, Hiroshima is the more deadly of the two, mostly because it lands kind of center city. And um, this is terror bombing at its extreme case. So a lot of books written about World War, uh, dropping of the atomic bomb into World War II. Um, whether this was justified or not, um, I have a little point here about rationale. Um, Truman, Harry Truman was by now president of the United States and ordered the dropping of the bomb. And so biographers of him had talked about, like David McCullough, the famous biography of Truman, who won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, talked about how, well, you know, the, the Truman administration justified dropping the bomb because it would save lives. We'll save more lives if we drop the bomb rather than an invasion, which will. Uh, and they're thinking they're thinking American lives here. They're not thinking Japanese lives. They're thinking American lives. Um, so it'll save more lives, and it'll. And we don't want to waste the time on troops. Um, this has been really questioned by some historians whether this is just sort of a BS uh, way of more of a revenge uh, story for uh, for uh, for Pearl Harbor. Um, yeah, I'd read too where the Japanese by this point were uh, uh, pretty desperate and they were training some of the villagers 
uh, most of in these small in these small towns in Japan to fight with like sticks and stones. So an invasion may have been fairly easy. Well, I mean, we don't know. We can't re we can't rewind history and find out. Uh, but this this idea that oh this would save lives is kind of I mean that's the government saying that is that true? I mean it's been questioned. So there's some historians that sort of raise doubt Truman's um, a doubt his uh, position there. So his rationale. So um, the atomic bomb uh, was you know brutal to to, to Hiroshima. I had all kinds of people burning from the inside out, uh, shadows of somebody being etched onto a wall because of the uh, the way the radiation moves through the body, and it actually will imprint a shadow of a person on a wall, so you can go through some parts of Hiroshima and see these shadows um, on, on walls. Um, obliterates the city, 100,000 dead, over 100,000 dead uh, instantly. Uh, and some even more later on uh, due to radiation um, makes it very uninhabitable. So, you know, this is, you know, uh, a huge show of force. And it'll be the atomic bomb or the fear of the atomic bomb that will um, sort of undermine the Cold War. You know, the, you can't have a World War Three. If you think of World Wars as everybody's big guns against the other. Okay, World War One was everybody's, it was a technological war, so everybody's most advanced weapon against another. World War II is very same thing. You can't really have a World War III because, this is the thinking, because it would destroy the, it would destroy all of humanity. If you had everybody's nuclear weapons against everybody else's, the world would come to an end. So uh, it would destroy the globe. So um, uh, this is sort of the under, the, the underwriting fear of the Cold War, which is sometimes known as the Age of Anxiety. Uh, poets talk about the Age of Anxiety. Uh, you know, this fear of nuclear weapons. Uh, we'll talk about the Cold War next. Uh, next, got another couple of videos. I think we have the 1950s that talk about in the United States. Uh, but it'll be the, the atomic bomb, the fear of the atomic bomb. I grew up at the very end of the Cold War. I don't remember bomb raids. My dad remembers bomb raids. Um, so we'll talk about this again. But you, you hide under your desk. Oh, the dreaded. And there were these videos. They're really stupid. I'll see if I can post a few. Um, but you you have these, you know, duck and cover videos. You hide under your desk with a dreaded atomic bomb, which it, it would kill you. I mean, you're, you're dead uh, if, if that would actually happen. Um, I don't remember bomb raids. Uh, that, I grew up in the 80s. So it was Reagan's administration and the Reagan, uh, administration of George H.W. Bush and the end of the Cold War. I remember the end of the Cold War, but I don't remember bomb raids. Uh, uh, things like this, uh, which in the 50s, I think they were more common. So we'll talk about the Cold War next, uh, and then we'll talk about society in the 1950s. Uh, you have this sort of the expansion of uh, the, uh, the U.S. economy, and of course the idea of the United States is now a superpower. It's one of the two superpowers, the other being the Soviet Union. Um, so, uh, which we, we still live with a legacy of the uh, World War II, uh, the idea of the superpower, the lone superpower. Uh, after the fall of the, after the Cold War, so uh, and what that means, so we still live with these uh, ramifications. So okay, until next time, see you later.